Well, thank you, David. After that introduction, I feel like saying, uh, hell, once a masochist, always a masochist. <laughs> but why change now? Um, when I was a teenager, um, in the early years of the second half of the last century, sounds a long time ago, doesn't it? There was a book, um, famous or infamous, I'm not quite sure which, it was called Everything You Always Wanted to Know About Sex But Were Afraid to Ask. And I think there's a kind of an expectation that I have a new version of that book in my pocket, which is everything you always want to know about Anglo, but we're afraid to ask. <laughs> well, I have, and I'm not going to give it out to you. Um, I feel a bit like one of these cops in, in the old television series, you know, it gets called in by the precinct captain, and he says, there's a bunch of people over there, we think they're up to something illegal. So we want you to go underground, join them, and, you know, sort it out. And the fellow goes off. Now, I, I can't succeed really in looking like a banker most of the time. I'm trying. Uh, but, you know, he goes off and he gets three days' growth of beard that never changes through the whole series. He wears a gold cross down here with loads of hair, um, a scruffy shirt, torn jeans, and a scuffed leather jacket. You know, he becomes very good at infiltrating these people. So good that the, the cops then regard him afterwards as a criminal. I feel a bit like that, you know. I don't know why. I don't know why. Um, Patrick has given, I think, a very interesting exposition of the three phases of the problem. And I'm really tempted to say that a good proposal would be to get Patrick and me given the job of sorting out the banks. And then the Sunday Business Post could get on uh, without any kind of ambiguity uh, promoting Willie Slattery to be governor of the central bank, uh, or his going look abroad. Um, which leads me to a comment that was made by a gentleman down here last night who wondered if we had to wait for Alan Dukes to step down so we could get some foreign banking expertise uh, into sorting out our problem. You don't, actually. Um, we would like, in Anglo, uh, to get some, some further uh, talent, uh, knowledge in to help us. Um, and I've been looking at this, but, you know, I wonder where we would go. There seem to me to be very few places in Europe where you can find a banking system that hasn't got some problems or skeletons in the closet. I thought for a while that, you know, in the UK they've had their problems, Benelux countries have had their problems, the Germans have had their problems. I'm not sure what we would do about Italy. And then I thought, well, Spain might be a good place to go because they've kept their own banks way out of the property crash. You know, their savings banks are in terrible trouble, but they've kept their own banks out, and the Santander Group has been going around the world buying up distressed banks all over the place. And then I found out that they had dropped, what was it, three or five billion with Bernie Madoff. So I said, oh, no Spaniards, thanks very much. And then we looked at Switzerland, you know, that bastion of banking uh, expertise, and UBS is in the horrors. So I said, no, no, uh, don't know where to go. Uh, and then I thought, Canada, that might be the good place to go. And I would be delighted to get a Canadian colleague from the banks to come and help us uh, to sort out the issues here. So you, you don't have to wait for me to step down, fall on my sword, or fall on anybody else's sword to do it. Uh, we're open to it. Um, the issue of cronyism was raised last night also by our esteemed chairman here. Uh, and just in case there are any questions that, that uh, might take up time that you would more usefully spend quizzing Dan, um, I'll tell you about cronyism. Um, I'm a member of the board of Anglo-Irish Bank. I'm a member of the board of Wilson Hartle Public Relations. I'm a member of the board, I'm chairman of the board of the Alliance Francaise in Dublin, and I'm a member of the board of the Irish Guide Dogs for the Blind. And as far as I know, no colleague on any one of those boards is a colleague on any other board. So, you know, you're not about to get the Alliance Francaise even influence coming into Irish banking circles. However, um, coming to, to the issue that's, that's before us, reforming and regulating banks, uh, I think there are a few uh, issues that are becoming clearer as, as we go through this process. But I think we should really be fully conscious of the context. As has been said here this morning by Patrick, I think it was, he said, we got ourselves into trouble all on our own uh, without getting into some of the fancy problems that American banks have. We did. Um, our problem was created. 
Uh, and we're not the only ones to have this uh, by uh, an excessively exuberant approach uh, to lending into the property sector during a period of sustained growth. Uh, that's what's got our banks uh, into major botheration. Uh, they're not the only ones who have. It's happened in other countries also. Um, but essentially, our problem in banking uh, doesn't have much to do uh, with the more arcane and more toxic instruments that have caused so much of a problem in the United States and in other jurisdictions. But that problem is important to us because our misfortune lies in the fact that we are having to deal with our own self-generated problem at a time when all the other banks are dealing with this other issue, at a time when we need credit to sort out our problem, but the supply of credit has dried up because of the things that have happened elsewhere. And I think it's worth bearing that in mind. It's a part of the background that we need to, to, to keep in mind uh, when we look at the lessons that are to be learned from other people's experience. Um, I think, for example, uh, a reference was made this morning uh, to, to the Swedish experience, very instructive. Uh, lessons are also sometimes taken from the Japanese experience, equally uh, instructive. But I think the key thing to remember, um, and it's a detail uh, that is important, is that the Swedish problem got sorted out in a much more benign world banking environment. Um, the Japanese problem kept going for years and years and years, despite uh, a very benign international banking uh, and financial sector for, for, for quite a part of the time. Um, there are some other uh, issues that I think uh, we need to understand when we come to define uh, what the resolution might be, what the new approach to banking policy and regulation uh, might be. Securitization is something that is widely credited with having made possible a very rapid expansion in credit. And that indeed is true. Uh, securitization did uh, facilitate very rapid expansions of credit, was used uh, in many cases uh, effectively and constructively uh, to, to develop economies, to develop sectors. Um, but it has its own problems. Securitization of its nature increases the distance between the original debt event and the paper that people are holding. So in a very real sense, um, it creates the kind of situation where you're playing a game of pass the parcel. But when the music stops, nobody knows who's holding the parcel anymore. And people who are holding the parcel don't know where they have to go to get value for the various bits of it that they hold. And that has been an enormous problem. Uh, and today we are seeing the effects of securitization, which means that the distance between the financial economy and the real economy increases. And the wider that distance gets, the bigger the problem is if there is a problem in the financial economy. It's, it's, it's interesting to, 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 uh, to look back uh, and see what this has meant in the major crises that we have gone through. In the big crash of 1929, and in the big crash of 2008, there was nothing much wrong with the real economy. People were still working, people were still producing, people were still demanding. And what really happened was that the supply of credit, for one reason or another, suddenly dried up, and all the real things that happened were suddenly brought to a halt. Um, and the, the crash was much bigger than it needed to have been, and the size of the crash depended on the gap between the financial economy and the real economy. And that is the situation that we're dealing with today. It arises in some part to an important extent from the process of securitization. And if we're going to sort out the problem, we have to look at what we're going to do about securitization uh, in the future. Um, we know the whole story about um, uh, the property boom. Uh, sustained periods of economic growth simply created an expectation uh, that property booms were going to continue, that property would continue to be safe, that property would continue to be uh, a reliably increasing store of value. Um, and I suppose we suffered from the psychosis that the more people who got involved in it, the more nobody wanted to be the first one to get off the ladder. Uh, and that's been a big part uh, of the problem that we've had to deal with. Of course, as that level of confidence um, increased, 
uh, and was maintained. More and more people got involved in it, and more and more people got more deeply involved in it. Uh, we saw, and we deplore, uh, the kind of development that led to the burgeoning of the subprime market in the United States, which has been a big part of the origin of the problem. We can't, I think, uh, hold ourselves blameless uh, for that kind of conduct. We didn't indulge in it to quite the same degree as it was indulged in in the United States, but we did it nevertheless. In the United States, there were many operators in the property market who not alone were engaging in what was called subprime lending, but who made loans irrespective of any inquiry uh, into the, the, the financial situation of the borrowers. So we had sub-subprime mortgages and securitization, which means slicing up these mortgages, repackaging them and handing them on to other people, uh, meant that it was more and more difficult to find if a default occurred, where you had to go to remedy the default. Now, we didn't do that uh, to quite the same extent here, uh, but it's not just anecdotal to say uh, that 100% mortgages were not unknown in Ireland. It's not anecdotal to say that 100% mortgages plus a top-up of 10% to furnish the house were unknown. And it's equally not unknown to say that uh, very high loan-to-value ratios uh, were not at all unknown in the commercial property market in Ireland. We engaged uh, with gay abandon uh, in, in, in that kind of lending, uh, and it's, it's come back to bite us. Um, I suppose, fortunately, in our case, most of that high loan-to-value ratio uh, type of lending in commercial property markets was not subsequently rolled on via securitization into other loans. So the problem hasn't got quite as complex here uh, as it has been in, in some other jurisdictions. Another problem that we've had is that the financial services sector got seduced uh, by the management guru's obsession in recent years with what they call driving shareholder value, which means that short-term gains are regarded as being much more important uh, than long-term steady asset appreciation uh, and value. Driving shareholder value means making as much profit as quickly as you can and, and you know, skipping in and out of, of lucrative uh, deals. And that has certainly been a feature of some of the activity uh, in our uh, commercial property sector. It's odd now you see how these fashions change. While driving shareholder value was the mantra of the gurus, the big crime of managers in any large company was to have cash. Now the banks have nothing to lend, so the big mantra of the management gurus now is to be liquid, to have cash. Um, and I'm sure that uh, unless we, we take some effective action, we will in a few years' time reap the disbenefits of an excessive concentration on that. Mind you, it means that in the meantime, if you have some cash and it's not tied up in your company um, and you're looking around for an investment, the place to look is in some kind of public utility that's publicly quoted that's cash rich. That's where to put your money for the next few years until we get this problem sorted out. But we will I almost certainly go overboard uh, with, with doing that. Um, the, the effects in the financial sector of this obsession with shareholder value um, have included the adoption of staff remuneration and bonus policies that were very strongly focused on short-term results and very frequently based on commission. I don't know if, you've, if any of you here um, spend much time looking at YouTube, I regard that as a totally useless waste of time, but I, I, there's one particular piece uh, that, that I saw recently that, that, that amused me. It says a lot about our current situation. A very elegant, obviously rich uh, young woman is on the telephone to her financial broker, whom you see on the other side of the split screen. He's in a very swish office on the 95th floor of a building somewhere, and he is talking earnestly to her, selling her some great financial product. As he talks to her, he opens the window and jumps out. 
And as he's falling from the 95th floor, he's still selling her the product on the way down. And that's really a little parable uh, of our times. And, you know, it's going to end up that whoever inherits his estate will have a big bundle of commission on the last deal that went terribly wrong. If you want, if you want to read um, a kind of an auto da fe, a, a horror story, there's a wonderful report of a group called the Counterparty Risk Management Policy Group um, by a group of people in the financial sectors in New York. It was published about two years ago uh, this month, August of, of 2007. Sorry, August of 2008. And it had all the big beasts in there. Bear Stearns, Morgan Stanley, Lehman Brothers, Goldman Sachs. They're all there. And they solemnly got together to, to, to produce recommendations for how we should sort out uh, the problems of financial markets. Almost every recommendation in it, uh, which is largely about self-regulation, is an indictment of what they have been doing up to then. And it includes a paragraph, one of the least jargonized paragraphs in it, which says that sophisticated financial instruments should probably not be sold to unsophisticated customers. <laughs> now, when you read that, and there are admissions in it, it means that there was a whole bunch of people on Wall Street selling financial products that they didn't understand to other people who understood even less about them than they did. And they were selling as many of them as they could because they were making big commissions on the trade. And that's how we got into a part of the problem we have. Now, as I say, we didn't, there's no, there are no super whiz financial dealers here. You know, and there's no um, hugely elegant, rich buyers of all these securities in the audience here. But the fact that all that happened now makes it much more difficult for us to have access to the kind of credit, both sectoral and sovereign credit, that we need uh, to sort out the problem that we're dealing with now. So what do we do about the regulators? God bless them and all their kind. Um, I think there is one thing that, that, that has emerged over in the experience that we've had, particularly in this country, in many sectors, and that is self-regulation does not work. Self-regulation is never enough. We have self-regulation, we've had self-regulation in the medical field, in the legal field, and largely in the financial field in this country, and it's never enough because self-regulation will never take account of all of the risks that the rest of society looks at. Self-regulation in the legal field means that people sometimes find it difficult to get a lawyer to take a case against another lawyer who has acted badly. Self-regulation in the medical field has produced problems that have been in our newspapers for years, uh, and some that will still be in the newspapers for years to come. It, it's never enough. Regulators, unfortunately, in almost every field, um, are much less nimble than market operators. Um, and that is a, a, an issue that has come up time and again. Market operators are adept at finding gaps in the regulatory system. And in the financial markets, there have been many cases of instruments or products that have been specifically designed to fit into the gaps of the regulatory system. And that has been the case with a lot of what have come to be known as the securitized instruments. It's also been the case of a much bigger trend that we've seen in the financial sector, which is to find ways of moving big chunks of assets and liabilities out of the balance sheets of financial operators so that their real situation has become obscured uh, rather than revealed by the publication of balance sheets drawn up in accordance with accounting laws and regulatory standards. Regulation has tended to be, in many jurisdictions, rather fractionated, dispersed. Um, if you look at the United States regulatory system, there is a whole squad of regulators of all kinds. The Fed and the FDIC compete. The SEC competes with both of them. Insurance regulation in the United States is a matter for the individual states, uh, not for the federal level. And unfortunately, and it's one of the problems of our financial market sectors, some of the 
the definition, some of the borders between insurance and finance have become blurred uh, to, to the detriment of good, good management. Um, there have been unresolved arguments between light touch regulation and detailed regulation. Um, there have been arguments between principles-based regulation and rules-based regulation. And while these arguments have been going on, the market sector has been gaily exploiting the differences between different regulators and getting in there into the gaps in the market, producing new products, producing new ways of doing business that escape uh, regulatory control. Um, regulators don't like admitting this, but there are some constraints uh, from which they suffer. Um, one of them is rather nationalistic, um, and I will illustrate it in an in a very sensitive way by not talking about the Irish regulators. I'll talk about what happens in other countries and mutatis mutandis, you can figure out what I really mean. In, in the UK, for example, the Financial Services Authority is sometimes much more concerned with ensuring that the City of London maintains its leadership in the financial sector than with actually doing what they should do to regulate the financial system in the UK. The same applies um, in, in the United States, um, and the same applies in Frankfurt. Uh, they're all concerned, first of all, to regulate, of course, they have a very proper concern, but they also want to make sure that in the appropriate cases, London or New York or Frankfurt don't get over-regulated by comparison with other people and lose their competitive advantage in the marketplace. And that means that regulation is not doing what it's supposed to do uh, to protect operators um, and customers in the final analysis in the market. Um, the other problem is that as between regulators and the regulated, uh, over time there's inevitably a degree of capture. The regulator sees the interest of the regulators and they have the kind of understanding that, that Patrick mentioned a few minutes ago. The regulators see the needs of the regulators and they try to avoid getting into areas where the regulator is going to have to uh, come the heavy on them. And that has been uh, a problem of excessive, in some cases, understanding uh, between the two sides. Um, regulators are sometimes reluctant to use the powers that they actually have. Um, this is a rather de delicate area, but I don't think that it, we can say, looking back, uh, that the Irish financial regulators over the last decade, and I'm being generous in using the decade, it's a shorter period than that that I mean really, but the Irish financial regulators haven't used to the full all the powers that they have. Because again, uh, they, they shared the view that you know, they didn't want to be the first ones to get off the ladder. They didn't want to be the first Cassandra who came along, um, and we have suffered uh, as a result. Um, it doesn't always have to happen, but it depends on the way regulators go about their business. In Spain, for example, they've had as bad a property crash uh, as we have. Uh, in Spain, you get the same kind of situation that I was told about here just the other day, where you have brand new, large apartment complexes you know, with several hundred apartments in them, three or four families living dispersed around this and no prospect of any neighbours coming to join them soon. The Spaniards have had that. But that's happened in Spain without their main banks being affected because the regulatory authority in Spain actually prevented the normal commercial banks from getting involved in property lending. Their savings banks are in terrible trouble now, but the main commercial banks were kept out of it by strong uh, regulatory action. There are some problems with regulation which are inherent and which I think are unavoidable. The more detailed and prescriptive the regulatory rules are, the greater is the incentive to find ways around them. And we can find there are umpteen examples of that. The tax avoidance industry, for example, is, is one. And the tax avoidance industry, I'm not talking about evasion now, I'm talking about tax avoidance. And that's an industry that's peopled by highly ethical and highly law-abiding people. And their ethics and their law-abiding instincts all go into defining the gaps in the law that they can exploit. 
And that is a problem inherent in detailed regulation. I used to think years ago when I was working on the farming side that the reason we had so many frauds in the beef markets in the European Union was that the rules were far more complex there than they were in the dairy sector. And the more detailed the rules are, the more easy it is to find a way around them. It's a problem that we have. And in addition to that then, financial operators have on the whole very successfully lobbied against uh, regulatory improvements. Um, it's true of the City of London, it's true of Wall Street, um, it's probably true here in Ireland. Um, even today when we see um, strong efforts being made by, by the American administration uh, to, to improve regulation, we can see the pushback already happening by the big beasts uh, on Wall Street. And it's very instructive uh, to look at the upper reaches of the financial regulatory authorities and the financial administration in the United States and see how many ex-Wall Street operatives there are in there. The chairman is looking a bit anxious. I think it's about time for me to, to conclude. Reforms. There are some things that I think stand out that need to be done. Number one, too big to fail is too big. We should not allow banks to get to the point where a major problem with any one of them causes big collateral damage uh, to everybody else. That's an anti-concentration argument that we have to take seriously. Capital adequacy ratios that are suitable for a given state of the market are not suitable for expanded uh, operations. So capital adequacy ratios for banks and other financial operators should be made an increasing function of size. That's a protection that, that we need. Regulators must be given and expected to have to operate explicit powers to halt excessive concentration of risk. And as a little sidelight, I think we need new definitions of concentration. I found in my own limited experience that the regulatory reporting we have of risk concentration misses very important factors. We need to redefine the concentrations and give regulators explicit powers to stop that. We need new rules for the operation of rating agencies. Apart from the schadenfreude of all of this, I have to say I think it's very odd to see regulatory agencies holding the fate of whole nations in their hands. These same people who promoted securitized instruments and who never, as far as I can remember, ever issued a caution against the use of, of securitized instruments until the crash came. And now they castigate people. And in some cases, those same regulatory agencies were the ones who sliced up the securitized assets and recommended that they're selling on. We need a new approach to, to those rating agencies. We need much stricter internationally agreed rules on securitization. That has been one of the problems at the heart uh, of, of, our, uh, of the credit crunch. We need to put an end to what are called over-the-counter dealings in securitized instruments because they produce a market that is huge and that is not accountable, where the operators don't know what the size of the market is and therefore cannot know what the degree of risk is. And finally, it seems to me that we need, again, strong international agreement on a simple proposition, that if you want to put a new financial product onto the market, you must be required to get pre-clearance of it from the regulators. Now that little menu that I've set out, which is incomplete, is one that I've been developing for about a year. And I've talked to a number of friends, colleagues and acquaintances about it, and it's deeply unpopular with financial operators, which suggests to me that I must be somewhere near the right track. Thank you. <laughs>